I'd like to call to order the regular business meeting of the Board of Education for Monday, December 9th to order. If I could ask everyone to please stand and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. The flag's right over here. The Pledge of Allegiance is to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, welcome everybody. Can I have a roll call, please? Stephen Arthur. Here. Jim Batson. Here. Alex Delipoli. Here. Pat Grudy. Here. Karen Lundstedt. Here. Owen Maurer. Here. Bill Ratzer. Here. Okay, everybody's present. Um, today's agenda, uh, we will have some uh, student recognition. For those who think we'll have a lot of student recognition tonight, uh, as well as some staff recognition. So welcome, everybody. Uh, no real president's report to report on tonight. Reports from our school board reps who are here. Uh, superintendent's report, we will open it up for public comment. Anybody who would like to speak, uh, I will remind you that we would like you to limit your comments to three minutes, please. Uh, we'll approve the consent vote agenda, which was reviewed earlier this evening in committee. Uh, updates from program and personnel and facilities and finance. Um, is there a property committee update or are we all set? We're all set. Okay. Yeah. Uh, CEDAW? Yep. Okay. Uh, Illinois Association of School Boards? Nothing. Nothing? Okay. And then we will convene an executive session uh, this evening to discuss litigation and collective bargaining. All right. All right. So let's start with um, our education presentation, student recognition. Dr. Fleming? This evening we have a prestigious group of students and staff that we would like to recognize. And we're going to start with our Illinois Theater Fest uh, and um, Dr. Scott and Dr. Swick. We'll start with you. Well, thanks. Uh, first thing we just want to say is uh, the theater weekend, the all-state weekend that the kids get to do in January is just a wonderful weekend. And we are just so happy that they get to, they have been selected and get to go. I actually got to go down there when our all-state play was down there and got to see all the workshops. And we just thank the board for giving the theater kids the opportunity to go to that all-state uh, workshop uh, uh, festival. So at this time, if the Vernon Hills, uh, three Vernon Hills uh, kids could come forward, uh, the person who's going to be all-state for our uh, play uh, as a cast member is Doug Millar right here. Congratulations, Doug, on that eye recognition. And then we also have Alex Nelson, who is on the all-state play as, far, uh, as for uh, the uh, crew. So this is Alex Nelson, and Scott Kinnear is also All-State as a crew member. So these are the three Vernon Hills uh, All-State kids, and we're just very proud of the work that they put in at Vernon Hills and hope for them to have a great All-State play uh, in January. So congratulations, all three of you, okay? okay. We just all have to adjust a little bit. Okay. Congratulations. We also have Drew Russell here, who is our uh, our fine arts department chair that uh, worked with the nomination of these kids. So, congratulations, Drew. Thank you. state plays it gives our two schools the opportunity to work together so I'm going to introduce our fine arts chair Dustin Halvey and he's going to introduce our young lady who is part of that um, just to piggyback on what Dr. Zwick said, um, the Illinois Theater Festival is um, the world's largest and oldest non-competitive theater festival in the world. So it's a pretty pretty cool thing that we have here in Illinois. And in addition to um, the workshops that Dr. Zwick had mentioned, there are only over 25 student productions that uh, students get to view. Um, so it's really quite an honor when these students get a chance to audition or to apply to be um, uh, production uh, company members of the of the production. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Hannah Anderson, who is our uh, crew member for the production Grapes of Wrath.
to introduce our girl swim coach, Barry Rogers, and he has some young ladies to introduce, uh, state contenders um, in swimming. And I just want to say one thing about our swim team. As you know, we have a great swim program at both schools. And as they come to my office in preparation for the state meet, I see more and more girls each year, which is a really exciting thing for, for me and for the school. So go ahead. And All right, uh, the four girls tonight who are on our medley relay, uh, Meredith Robbins, come on up, Macy Neubauer, mm -hmm. Stacey Hirschenbach, and Sophia Lacks. Come on. A quick word about the, the relay to put into context uh, what they did in the last 20 years. On the girls' side, we've only ever had three relays make it. Mm -hmm. um, it's all state. Uh, this year, they managed to win the conference championship. They won the sectional championship. They broke the school record by two and a half seconds. They broke the Libertyville pool record by two and a half seconds. And they broke the conference record by a second. So um, all in all, pretty amazing uh, set of accomplishments. They are awesome. <laughs> Congratulations, Neil. staff recognition that um, Dr. Lee is going to introduce. Okay, we have some very exciting news tonight. We're very excited to share some awesome news with you from the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. We have received notification that four additional District 128 teachers have met the challenging and rigorous requirements to earn National Board certification. When the District 128 Board and Administration initially worked with our union to negotiate National Board Certification incentive language into the collective bargaining agreement seven years ago, we had two <laughs> National Board certified teachers, one of which is here tonight. The four new NBC teachers joined our 16 current NBC teachers to raise a District 128 total to 20 nationally board certified teachers. With that said, on behalf of the Board of Education, District and Building, administration and the entire District 128 family. We extend a very special appreciation, congratulations, and thanks to our four new D128 teachers who have earned this important distinction. This distinct achievement is a testament to the Herculean efforts of the teachers involved in the NBC process. They're probably smiling right now because it is truly Herculean. In addition, it is a testament to the caring and skilled leadership and mentoring work of Brian Twiddell and Paul Reed with the NBC cohort group. So special appreciation and thanks to Brian and Paul for their guidance as well. And now to introduce our four new nationally board certified teachers is Dr. Al Fleming, Associate Superintendent, and we would ask Dr. Swick and Dr. Scott to step forward as well to congratulate our newly certified, uh, nationally board certified teachers. So would Alyssa Clark, Karen LaMaestro, Ann Singleton and Jay Walden, please step forward. And I think uh, Brian's special recognition to Brian, would you please come forward too? our educational presentation. So you're all welcome. 
we'd love to have you stay, but you're all welcome to go if you'd like to do it. We'd love to stay. All right, so that was exciting. Some academic achievements, some athletic achievements, achievements. <laughs> All right. Um, as I said, nothing on the president's report. Reports from the student school board representatives. Kate, how would you like to go first? Um, so at Vernon Hills, we have our variety show going on Thursday of this week. Um, all proceeds are going to go to Cove. Uh, thanks to council for that. Um, and then our Cove Care Packages uh, service project for this year um, concludes on Wednesday, where we're going to send. Um, a shoebox of supplies to every kid at uh, our sister school in Uganda. Um, intramural basketball kicked off. Uh, that's, that's going pretty well. Um, this past weekend, uh, there was a JSA conference, the Junior State of America Debate Club. Um, students from Vernon Hills were facilitators, moderators, and award-winning speakers. Um, there were several um, athletic signings, uh, Nick Newman for baseball, and then Sydney Smith and Lauren Webb for basketball. Um, the Vernon Hills Chamber Choir um, has a lot of holiday engagements and they're performing. Uh, they performed at Mariano's and they'll be performing for the Lake Forest Police Department. Good. Um, for Libertyville, we have a lot of, should I stand or? No, you can oh, it's okay. You're fine. <laughs> All right, so so there, there are a lot of academic clubs going on right now. We talked about Mata Yuan recently. Um, they had their next, our next conference for Mata Yuan is in January, but debate, we just had a tournament <coughs> on Saturday. Uh, and we had a student get first place for varsity Lincoln Douglas debate, and second place for junior varsity Lincoln Douglas debate. Uh, so that's really, really big deal. It's really cool. Uh, Wise, uh, worldwide youth in science and engineering. Uh, we had an OP science conference in Milwaukee at MSOE. Uh, we got second place as a team and had a lot of top individual scores there. So our Wise team's always going to be renowned. We won nationals a couple of years ago. So. It's a good showing from them. Um, and then in terms of athletics, basketball got off to a 5-0 and start, which is a lot better than the, I think, six wins we had all of last year. Um, we're very good. We have a game against Stevenson on Wednesday, which is a little bit like basketball in there. Uh, Stevenson's really good. They have a point guard who's the best point guard in the nation for his age group, so he's going to be in like, the NBA. So it's going to be a big game. There's a lot of incentives that are bringing up for the students to go to this game, like steak and shake shakes for students. Um, so hopefully we get a lot of support behind our basketball team. I know I'm going to go because those games are always fun. We saw girls swimming, um, had a successful run at state, and then our winner play is set as a play called Owl Wilderness. Uh, I'm not quite familiar with it, but I always go see the play, so I'm going to go see it, and hopefully it's good. Um, yeah, just adding on to that, December is in full swing. Every Friday we have hot chocolate Fridays, and like make everybody's week easily. Um, Wish is also going on, so I think next week we'll be purchasing the gifts, or I think, I think some classes already have, purchasing the gifts for their families and um, the Wish dinner is coming up. Um, band just recently had a very successful band concert, and then choir has their holiday festival on Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. I think I was on campus on a Tuesday, and there was hot chocolate on Tuesday, too, so... Yeah, it's pretty for you. They're always selling these on this for hot chocolate. All right, good. Thanks very much for the update. Um, superintendent's report. Okay, believe it or not, we have uh, more good news. The District 128 Foundation for Learning awarded 15 innovation grants to LHS and VHHS teachers on November 20th. This year's re recipients received 25188 dollars and 66 cents in funding for projects that will enhance and enrich student learning at LHS and VHHS. This latest round of grant winners brings the total amount of money given by the foundation since 2008 to $101,387. So thank you so much to the foundation and for our teachers that continue to apply for foundation grants. District 128 has been named to the College Board's fourth annual Advanced Placement District Honor Roll. D-128 was one of only 477 school districts in the entire United States and Canada to receive this honor. 
This is D128's third consecutive appearance on the AP District Honor Roll, which recognizes efforts to open AP classrooms to a significantly broader pool of students while maintaining or improving the percentage of students earning scores of three or higher. LHS student artists uh, Karen, Kate Jarecki and Don Bronco placed in the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth's um, first annual virtual art invitational. Kate received second place for her floss vessel and Don received a third place for her topographical ring. The LHS and VHHS WISE teams had amazing performances at the November 26th OP science competition held at the Milwaukee School of Engineering. The VHHS team finished first out of 17 teams. Over 130 students competed and individual honors were awarded to Michaela Kunvaranen in biology and overall top 15 score, Justin Song, general science and overall top 15 score, Victoria Steigerwald in biology, chemistry and overall top 15 score, Justin Yim in biology, chemistry and overall top 15 score, and Eric Zhang, overall top 15 score. LHS fi finished second in the competition. Individual honors were awarded to Brent Kao in physics, Becky Ratzer in physics, Jack Bomruck in physics and overall top 15 score, Heather Lagan in chemistry and overall top 15 score, and Cor Rostogi in chemistry, general science and overall top 15 score, and Tim Lee in chemistry, physics, and overall top 15 score. Brian LeMay, a freshman at LHS and co-captain of the men's Thundercats fencing team, won the bronze medal at the Junior Olympic qualifiers held at Northwestern University. As a top place finisher, Brian earned the right to compete in the fencing Junior Olympics to be held in Portland, Oregon on February 14th through the 17th um, in 2014. 34 members of the VHHS Junior State of America Club were among the 375 students from 25 schools in Illinois, Indiana, Mich Michigan, and Wisconsin who participated in the recent Midwest Conference held in Madison, Wisconsin, December 6th through the 8th. Club President Misha Bagnadov did a fantastic job as the Director of Debate for the conference. Junior Shubham Patel won two Best Speaker Awards and junior Vahab Shastri won a Best Moderator Award. So congratulations to all the students for their continued outstanding achievements. The board will note that they have two FOIA requests in their packet tonight. And Dr. Gurdy, that concludes the superintendent's report. Okay, thank you. Um, at this time, anybody from the public who would like to speak? Okay. Just uh, name and where, which community you live in and speak up for the camera to make sure that they can. <laughs> I've got a written statement which I'll present to each one of you. Sure, now. okay. But my name is Craig Arlinger. Uh, it's, it was not an easy task for me to put this together and come tonight, but I feel that um, in the best interest of my fellow retired people who work in this staff in this district, that I need to speak for them as well. First of all, I'd like to congratulate all of the administration, support staff, teachers, and board for continuing to provide the students that reside within the district an outstanding education. When the decision was made to add another high school to the district and to retire the Brainerd Building from classroom use, the goal was and continues to be to maintain two quality high schools. The awards in athletics, fine arts, science, and math, and the overall academic performance are the fruits of the combined efforts of the employees of the district. The parents have taken active interest in their children's education and of course, the outstanding young people who occupy both of our campuses. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Craig R. Hunter, and I'm a lifelong resident of Libertyville and a product of the Libertyville Public School Systems. I graduated from LHS in 1966, not ever dreaming that in 1971, I would be fortunate enough to return to LHS as a teacher and a coach. From 1971 until my retirement from the classroom in 2004, I've been blessed to be a part of the District 128 family. And today I'm still employed as the JV Boys and Girls Tennis Coach at LHS. The purpose of my attendance tonight is to bring to the attention of this board my concerns over the way in which the district notified the staff in regards to the class action lawsuit involving the Gallagher Insurance Brokerage Antitrust litigation. I first became of this lawsuit in June of 2012 after settlement checks started showing up to several past and present employees of the district. Colleagues of mine asked if I had received a check and I had no idea what they were talking about, so I began making phone calls and investigating the circumstances surrounding this lawsuit. 
The result of this investigation led me to seek answers from the district office. On June 24, 2012, around 3.30 p.m., I entered the district office and asked if there was someone who could explain the issuance of the insurance checks to some and not others. Dr. Lee was available and he took the time to catch me up on the history of the lawsuit. He explained that in 2007, the district had been notified of this impending lawsuit and they had responded by placing signs in the copy rooms of both buildings and it was up to the individuals to file for compensation. When I asked Dr. Lee how the retirees were informed, his response was that the school's lawyers said the placement of the signs was appropriate and satisfied the order of the court. Although the suit was settled, sometimes in these cases there is a secondary pool of unclaimed dollars. So before leaving, Dr. Lee walking down to the business office to get information from Yasmin on how to contact Gallagher directly to ask about the stats. Yasmin provided me with the information to check on this. I called the next day and was told that all funds had been distributed and that the case was closed. I asked the representative how clients that had retired from the respective districts had been notified. He would only repeat the case was closed. Over the past month, I've continued to dig for answers to try to establish the timeline of events. I continued calling fellow retirees and seeking out current employees as to whether or not they were aware of this lawsuit. I personally spoke with 12 employees who received compensation and 13 that did not. I compiled a list of teachers and staff that retired in each year covering the lawsuit from 1996 through 2006. People that retired in 2006 would have been covered up to December of 2005. I have no way of knowing how many of these people had a PPO or if they are on their spouse's policy and therefore not part of the Gallagher benefit package. But I have identified 44 retired teachers which include one superintendent, two principals and two deans. I found 20 retired support staff, which include librarians, secretaries, cafeteria staff, and a school nurse. I know of only two people who retired prior to 2006 that received compensation. And those individuals had the good fortune of being alerted by a person, by a friend, who was a former LHS teacher slash union representative to fill out the forms. Originally, this person went to the White House, which was the former administrative office, and inquired about the suit after reading about it on the Gallagher website. She was told by Yasmin not to bother filling out the form because it wouldn't come to anything. She ignored the advice and started calling people with approximately 24 hours until the deadline for filing. I was made aware of that, this situation on December 4, 2013. I am including in this letter a copy of what I believe might have been posted in the workrooms of both buildings titled Exhibit H to inform the staff of the impending lawsuit, even though I have no proof they were actually posted. I still do not know when or where this was posted and who was responsible for putting it up and who gave the posting instructions. I'm also including a copy of the email that was sent to all employees on June 12, 2012 at 3.53 p.m. from Mary Tadori. This email was sent out after some people started questioning the distribution of checks. I am deeply troubled that this emailed method of communicating to the staff was not done in 2007 when the district was first informed of this litigation. On November 26, 2013, I called the district offices of Stevenson High School and was informed that their entire staff received a mass email in 207 informing them of the impending litigation. And I specifically asked how they contacted retirees as we told that the same email was sent to all retirees as long as they were in their system and had not chosen to be taken off their staying connected list. Late on the same day, I returned to the District 120 office and filled out a Freedom of Information form requesting any record showing payments to the district in regards to the Gallagher lawsuit. Within a couple days, I received a response, and I have included a copy of that response. As a result of this litigation, District 128 received a check in the amount of $82,136.63 as its share of the cost of the employee benefits package. I don't begrudge the district its share of the settlement, as is well deserved. What I strongly object to is the fact that the administration did not use the same due diligence to inform everyone of the lawsuit as they did after the questions arose, for example, signed postings versus email. Then everyone would have had the opportunity for compensation. The decision to file a claim rested solely on the individual as the email stated, and District 128 was not required to provide the names of its employees to the court. While the administration feels that they followed the letter of the law, I believe that their lack of attention to retired and current employees violated the spirit of the law. Personal notification to all would have at least demonstrated that the District 128 was truly interested in alerting its family as to the compensation that was available to all that were harmed. 
how hard would it have been to send out a mass email, or at the very least, notify the building principals, who in turn could have distributed this information to the various department chairmen, and in turn pass this on to the staff. This information should also have been directed to the union reps in each building. The idea of staying connected did not work in this case, and the small number of people that actually received compensation is proof of the half-hearted attempt by the district office to notify its personnel. Was it the administration's expectation that retired employees would, for some reason, return and enter the area where the signs were posted? Perhaps the most ironic, ironic example of how uninformed the retired personnel were in this situation is the fact that there was a former department chairman who was also a member of this very Board of Education that received no notification of this matter until after it was settled. I have no way of knowing if this matter is due to incompetence, negligence, or whether it was intentional, but I feel this information needed to be shared with this board. You can feel free to contact me for any information that I have collected. Thank you. I have a copy for the I'll just make one comment while yeah, um, your time. Craig's um, thank you, Craig, is passing the letter out. Um, and I would say, and uh, Craig, I believe I said to you, and I also said to Judy when I had a conversation with her about this on the backside when we did fact finding on this, that if we rewound the tape um, and we did this over, then we would certainly do what you've suggested, and that is email to our best attempt to email everyone either through staying connected. Um, or whatever means that we had to contact um, uh, people on behalf of the district. And given the technology that we had today and the way we use it, that that is you know, certainly in the realm of possibility. So um, on behalf of the district, I think I would say again that, um, as I said to you that day, the timeline to my knowledge had passed at the time that we talked. And uh, I will apologize on behalf of the entire district that we didn't do that. Um, I'm sure that with um, any of the individual retirees that I've come, I know some of the other staff has also talked with them um, as well. And uh, if we could redo that, we would certainly send out the email because I agree with you, I think that's the right thing to do. So can I ask one question? Sure. Um, I guess my question is, and I don't know for answer tonight, but I mean, how do we, I don't know, memorialize, doesn't seem like the right line here, how do we make sure that the essence of this is captured such that when none of us are here, we still remember and, and, and know to follow that up? Is there anything that can be done? I mean, not only we proceduralize it, um, because I don't think there's a procedure to govern that, but is there anything we can do? Because again, I can imagine the day, maybe it's not, right. you know, the next generation, it's the generation right. after that. Exactly. But, I mean, I think this idea of broader communication on these topics is one we probably need to address and just say, hey, here's our plan going forward so that when none of us are here, we still remember the these things. If that makes any sense. Yeah, let's just, let's, we'll does. table the yeah, so let's come back to yeah. that and, and even think about whether there's anything we can do to sort of leave a legacy that gets carried on. I, I, I didn't know that I'd seek any, any no, no, that's okay. oh, sure. or anything of that nature, but um, just to okay. maybe alert, I, I don't think the matter is done. I think there's still a possible uh, litigation that might be on the table. Um, and I know that uh, there are several people that are still working in both buildings that are not retired that felt that they were slightly as well. Um, the signs were posted and they you know, didn't see it. But as a retiree, there was absolutely no way mm -hmm. of knowing. And just so you know, the dollar amount was significant. In my case, it would have been close to four thousand dollars. Okay. So again, we'll, we'll we'll just hold for further discussion at some point on this topic of communication and what we believe our role is. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, consent vote agenda. Okay, we reviewed this earlier. If I could ask for a motion to approve the consent vote agenda as listed, please. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Arthur? Aye. Gadsden? Aye. Dally Polly? Aye. Brudy? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Mauer? Aye. Dredser? Aye. All right, motion carries. Program and Personnel Committee, Chairperson Mauer. Okay, um, we first have Board Policy 6300 graduation requirements. This is the second reading, so we're looking for a motion to accept it as is. Um, so moved. Second. Any discussion? 
Roll call. Gadsden? Aye. Jelly Polly? Aye. Gritty? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Mauer? Aye. Ratzer? Aye. Arthur? Aye. Okay, then we have a section of board policies for first reading. No motion needed. First is board policy 360, administrative responsibility of the building principal. This has been amended um, to require assistant principals to be evaluated in the same man manner as principals. It articulates the new reporting requirements that have been made law by the Firearm Concealed Carry Act. The next policy is um, policy 4100, insurance management, and that mandates catastrophic insurance to benefit student athletes who sustain an accidental injury in IHSA school event for medical expenses in excess of $50,000. Um, we've been, I just want to note that we've been doing that all along, however, now it's a part of our policy as well, or will be when we approve this next time. Um, next, we have 550, Drug and Alcohol Free Workplace. Um, it adds to the list of activities prohibited of employees to include possession, use, or being under the influence of medical cannabis. Then we have Policy 590, Abused and Neglected Child Reporting. Um, this mandates reporting of any the addition is, man, is mandating the reporting of any hazing instances, and it requires the training for relevant staff members on abused and neglected children. So that would be any volunteer coaches or people like that. Um, next we have uh, 6250, community resource persons and volunteers. That adds voluntary coaches to the mandatory hazing requirement articulated in policy 590, the one that we previously talked about. Um, next we move to 7185, teen dating violence prohibited. That's a new policy. It requires all school boards to have a policy on this topic, as well as training for relevant staff members, so that if staff members become aware of a situation in which um, there was violence in a teen dating situation, they would be required to report that as well. Um, and then Section 8, oh, 8, Policy 830, Visitors to and Conduct on School Property. Um, the change to this policy prohibits weapons and medical cannabis on school property, including parking areas. So those are the changes. Any questions on all of those? Quite a few. Okay, then the next uh, part of the agenda has to do with physical education waivers. Um, it says rationale on existing board policy 6310, and that is credit for alternative courses and programs and course substitution, I believe. Um, and that is why do we have that? I believe this is um, talking about the policy in which we have six listed areas in which students can opt out of their PE requirement because they're in an IHSA uh, sport or a club or something to that effect. Um, the reason we have that is not because um, we're trying to test the physical fitness of people. We are um, trying to give them a chance to do some homework or to opt out of that PE course during the time of their season and just during the time of that season only. It's not a full year exemption. So I believe that's the rationale for having that existing policy. Anyone have anything to add to that that I maybe missed? No. Okay, um, then we'll move to Board Policy 6310, and that's giving credit for alternative courses and programs. This is a first reading, and we're changing that same policy that we just talked about to include a sixth category, and that is um, allowing for adaptations and modifications to PE courses when it's required in a student's IEP for our special needs students who have these individualized education programs. So this would be the first reading. Are there any questions on that? Okay. Then we'll move to educational tour requests. Um, Ellen, one question. Yeah. Al, we've got an asterisk on the agenda. Oh, what do we have to do for that? Yeah. It's a first reading, so usually we don't vote on it, right? We have an asterisk on the agenda. Do we need to? Oh, oh he's now stepped out. So. I, well, we can come back to that if I go to the next. Yes, one. yes. Um, let's but do that. it's a first reading, so I'm not sure. I mean, we have to have two readings. Sure, I believe. There may be a timeline on oh, it that a first reading. First so reading. so yeah. I just want to make sure. So yes, we can go okay. back to that. Alan. Okay. So then we'll go. We'll come back to that. Then. Okay. So then section D. Um, we would like to approve the educational tour request to send the Vernon Hills High School varsity softball. Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky, in March. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Jelly Pelly? Aye. Grudy? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Mauer? Aye. Grasser? Aye. Arthur? Aye. Gatson? Aye. Okay, then we'll just come back to that. Should, when Dr. Fleming gets back, I'll just ask him if we need yes. to get back to that. Yes, that'd Otherwise, be fine. we can just move on to facilities and finance. Okay, and good plan with the report. 
For the uh, Facilities and Finance Committee, we have uh, three items here. The first is an approval for um, uh, HVAC, emergency HVAC repairs. Uh, per the uh, state uh, code, the, we, the district has the ability to make uh, specific repairs um, uh, without uh, pre-approving the amount, uh, the specific amount, so this gives uh, the administration the ability to make those uh, repairs. Uh, as necessary, um, and I believe a lot of this work is happening over the, the break. Um, emergency repairs mm -hmm. that we need to do. Um, basically, it is asking your uh, permission to move forward with the emergency repairs we need to make at Libertyville High School okay. to address uh, the water situation and the fact that uh, uh, we're doing it so that uh, we can address the situation right away. Yeah. So we need a, uh, a motion and a second. I make a motion that we approve the emergency HVAC repairs at Libertyville High School. Second. Any uh, discussion? Okay. Uh, roll call. <coughs> Lundstedt? Aye. Maurer? Aye. Radzer? Aye. Arthur? Aye. Batson? Aye. Kelly Foley? Aye. Grudy? Aye. Okay. Second item is uh, some. Uh, Flood remediation work uh, to be uh, taken care of at uh, uh, LHS. Uh, any comments on that? Now you received five bids, of which three were actual general contractor bids. Two were withdrawn because they were just plumbing companies that were bidding. And I'd like the board to accept the bid from Stuckey Construction Company of Waukegan for the base bid in the amount of $604,000 and the alternate bid number one in the amount of $46,000. And that would repair the ramp and drain tile replacement around the building and repair the retaining wall cracks that are by, by the loading docks. Okay. Included in this amount is $60,000 worth of contingency, so that cost may come down. And that's the lowest uh, responsible bidder, if you will. If you accept. Both. If you accept parts. the alternate yeah. bid, right? Work will commence the Monday after the students leave for winter break. And this is just as a, a refresher. This is to, to repair some significant damage that took place um, on April 16th in the basement of Libertyville High School, the sub basement. Uh, it is to basically to jackhammer all of the flooring to then remove that because there's no way to get to that basement, so it's all manual work, to replace the flooring, also to do a drain tile in, in the interior around the sub-basement, to do two ejector pumps, and uh, to get the water outside of the basement out uh, to the, out off the property. Also to cement and abandon the one drain sewer pipe that we have in there to make sure that water never comes in there again. Uh, and then in summertime, we will address the alley and the boiler room problem with also some ejector pumps and so forth. That was a big mess. Yeah, I guess it was. All right. We have a uh, motion and a second. I move to accept the bid from the Stuckey Construction Company and the Mount Jess Division to remediate the LHS flood button. Second. Cool. Any uh, comments, questions from the board? Okay. The roll call. Mauer? Aye. Bradser? Aye. Arthur? Aye. Batson? Aye. Jolly Pally? Aye. Grudy? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. And the last item on the facilities and finance is the uh, bills payable for December 31st. Since we won't have a, a board meeting later in the month, this is early in the month. This covers the bills that will be payable through the, the remainder of the month. Uh, so, uh, any other further comment? That was just to um, this was uh, pay the bills uh, during the balance of this yeah. month, so that we can pay them by June 30th. Uh, I'm sorry, December 3rd. Because we don't have another board meeting. Right. We do not have a board meeting until yes. January 21. I make a motion that we approve, that we allow the payment of bills and get the paperwork afterward 
um, until December 31st. Second. Brad, sir. Aye. Arthur? Aye. Batson? Aye. Jelly Polly? Aye. Gertie? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Mauer? Aye. And that concludes the uh, facilities and finance. Did we need to? Uh, we don't need to go back. It was okay. just a typo. We don't yeah. need okay. to ask for the typo. All right, good. All right. Um, nothing property, no oh, CEDAW. Uh, CEDAW did have its quarterly governing board meeting uh, last week. However, a forum was not present, so we weren't able to take any action on any kind of um, business. However, they did give us an update um, on the ongoing discussions between the uh, districts that are petitioning to leave CEDAW and the CEDAW board and trying to protect um, the integrity of, of CEDAW. So it's, uh, I have copies you guys can have of, of where they're at, but they're, they're it's certainly in the middle of negotiations back and forth um, since October. And consider, uh, that will continue on for a, a bit. So we'll give you updates as they come in, but uh, they're not at a place where they agree all right, good. Uh, nothing from the Illinois Association School Board. Right. All right, and then that's it. So we're going to um, convene an executive session this evening. Um, two agenda topics. One is uh, pending or possible litigation. Uh, and the second is collective bargaining. Um, the first one being 5 ILCS 120-2C11. And the second from the Illinois School Code section 120-2C2. Okay, so if I... Uh, lightly voting on something to have to All right, so we session. will be taking action on the first topic, I believe. Uh, yes, correct. All right, okay. If I could ask for a motion to um, convene executive session. I make a motion that we go into executive session for a reasonable list Second. Second. Roll call, please. Arthur? Aye. Batson? Aye. Kelly Kelly? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Monstead? Aye. Mauer? Aye. Batson? Aye. Okay, thanks everybody. We will be back Aye. Aye. for. Um, a motion to reconvene an open session, please. So moved. Second. All right. Roll call. Any roll call vote? Uh, yeah. Arthur? Aye. Batson? Aye. Kelly Polly? Aye. Trudy? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Ratzer? Aye. All right. Motion carries. We're back to open session. All right. So uh, I'd ask for a motion. Okay. Uh, uh, the administration, uh, after review with uh, legal counsel and uh, the other districts affected by the Lancaster detachment um, lawsuit, uh, would recommend that um, we uh, continue the lawsuit uh, into the appeal phase and that we appeal the decision of the circuit court uh, in that case. And I'm looking for board approval uh, to authorize our counsel to do that. So a motion to authorize council to proceed with the appeal process. Yes, on the Lancaster attachment. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All right, roll call, please. Batson? Aye. Nelly Powell? Aye. Grudy? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Ratzer? Aye. Arthur? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Anything else? Motion to adjourn. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks. Good night, everybody.